Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Alcohol What You Need to Know presentation. My name is Jade, and I am with Join Together Northern Nevada, and I will be presenting to you on this topic today. So before I start, I want to tell you guys to please take out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil to jot down notes. There is going to be a quiz at the end, so I really encourage you to write down any notes um, that you think is going to be helpful to remember so that you can do well on that quiz. So with that being said, let's get started. All right, so what is alcohol? So we all know alcohol is a drink, right? But because it's a drink, I think people forget that it's also a drug. So alcohol is indeed a drug, more specifically a depressant. And depressants, like alcohol, they slow down the brain. And I'm gonna get into this a lot more uh, further into the presentation. So we're also going to go over that underage drinking does not only affect your health, but other parts of your life. And then I wanted to give you guys a stat too to kind of lead off the presentation. So alcohol is the third leading preventable cause of death in the US. So we're going to go over today why alcohol um, affects so many people in our lives and how we can prevent from being at risk for addiction and just alcohol abuse in general. Okay, so what is the law? So I think we all know that you can't drink until you're 21 years old, right? But even if you are under 21 and you are getting drinks from your parents, from your friends, from your older siblings, it is still illegal. If you're drinking at home and no one else knows, it is still illegal there too. So if you are under age 21, no matter how you got the alcohol or where you're drinking this alcohol, it is still illegal. Um, so all states have a zero tolerance for drivers under 21, which means you will lose your license if you're caught drinking and driving underage. So if you're caught drinking and driving and you're over 21, there's pretty serious consequences, but they're even more serious if you're under 21. So depending on the circumstance, uh, depending on the state, you may also face a steep fine, jail time, alcohol counseling, driver's classes, vehicle impoundment, and probation. So a lot of serious consequences, not only to you know, losing your license, but also to your life and other people's lives. That's super dangerous. So before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of the brain, I wanted you guys to watch this video. It's kind of an overview of why we should wait until 21. So, you know, lawmakers and, you know, our country, we didn't just pick 21 just because it was a random age. There's a reason why we need to wait until we're 21. So I'm going to play this video. Uh, don't worry about taking notes during the video. Just really concentrate on the content. And I'll give you guys some time after the video to write down any notes that you want to. It's important to understand that everyone in the world has addictions, or rather natural addictions, to things that are good, like food, water, and sleep. These natural addictions are important for our health and survival, and without them, we would not hunger or crave the things we need to survive. Now, we aren't exactly born with these natural addictions. Our body creates them. Let's look at an example. When you bite into an apple, your brain says, yum. Your brain recognizes that this apple is good for you. It has nutrition, vitamins, and gives your body the energy it needs to survive. Whenever the brain recognizes something that's good, it releases a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine causes you to experience pleasure. It's what makes you feel good, like when biting into an apple. The brain releases this dopamine in order to teach the body that this is healthy and good for your survival, and that it should remember to do it again. Now, there are other things we do that can release the pleasurable dopamine like playing video games, exercising, or reading a good book. However, the amount of dopamine released during these activities is less than what's released when we eat food. The brain does this so it can recognize which is more important. So if you go two days without reading a book, or two days without eating food, your body is going to crave the food over the book. As such, your brain creates what's called a hierarchy of survival, which ranks how important each of these things is to your survival. Now, there are some things that will not cause the release of dopamine, like eating soap or punching yourself in the face. The brain knows that these things are not good and therefore does not release the pleasurable dopamine because your brain does not want you to do it again. Now, let's look at alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, and other drugs. These are all classified carcinogens, 
proven to cause cancer and other fatal diseases. Now, your brain should recognize that these things are harmful to your body. However, these substances have special chemical characteristics that fool the brain into releasing dopamine, oftentimes in much greater amounts than the body has ever experienced before. Because of this, the body is fooled into thinking that these things are good and important, sometimes even more important than food, water, or sleep, and consequently hijacks the number one spot in your survival hierarchy. So now, if you go two days without eating or two days without drinking alcohol, your body will actually crave the alcohol over the food. This is an extreme case of addiction, where the person addicted believes that they will die if they don't get it. The severity of the addiction depends on where the alcohol or drug lies within your hierarchy of survival, and can increase even with casual use. Research shows that people under the age of 21 are at the highest risk of having their survival hierarchy hijacked. Why? Because their brains are still growing and developing, and are hypersensitive to false shocks of dopamine caused by these harmful substances. By 21, the brain is more fully developed and mature and the survival hierarchy becomes more permanent and less susceptible to getting hijacked. The flip side is that once you are 21, it becomes very difficult to remove these harmful substances from your survival hierarchy. Studies show that 9 out of 10 people who currently struggle with addiction started drinking, smoking, or using before the age of 21. Understanding addiction as a preventable disease can help save millions of lives. The decision to wait until 21 could mean the difference between a life enslaved by addiction or a life full of success and accomplishment. Want to learn more? Visit us at wait21.org. All right, guys. So you can see from that video how important our brain development has to do with waiting until we're 21 to drink and try to abstain from it while we're below that age. So I really like this video because it gives a really great overview of that. So right now I'm going to give you guys about 30 seconds to finish writing any notes or to just jot down some of the things that you want to from that video. And then we will continue on. So I'll give you 30 seconds starting right now. All right, so we are going to start on the health effects of alcohol. We're gonna start inside of the body. What does alcohol do to us? So up on the screen, I have the short-term effects of alcohol. So I'm gonna start at the brain and I'm going to go clockwise. So if you wanna follow along, that's the way I'm going. So the brain, impaired motor skills, judgment, um, damage to short-term memory, stroke, headaches, so as you can see, that's a lot of different things being affected by alcohol just during the short term. So short term can mean from one drink or to even a few sips, not even finishing a drink. And it's going to vary from individual to individual, depending on your genetics, your body, your age, your height. All of those things come into play. But generally, these are the short term effects that everyone can experience. So as you see, the brain had a lot of different effects. And you know, the brain is the powerhouse of our body, right? It controls everything that we do. So of course, there's gonna be a lot of things affected with the brain. So let's move on to vision. So vision, you're you, you can become dizzy. Um, you might have blurred vision and bloodshot eyes. So this right here, I mean, no one wants to be dizzy or have blurred vision, right? You want to be able to see, but this can really affect your health and just even your, um, your safety. So if you have blurred vision and you're feeling dizzy and you are drinking with strangers, or maybe you're trying to walk home from a party or something, you know, that could really put your health and your life at risk. So let's move down to the heart. So increased blood pressure. With increased blood pressure, a lot of the times you'll see that the person is sweating also and becoming just very warm. Uh, so down to the stomach, you can experience nausea, vomiting, and alcohol poisoning. So especially if you are drinking a lot um, in a small amount of time, your stomach can become really uncomfortable and throwing up and vomiting is your body's way of saying, you know, get this out of me. It's not supposed to be inside. 
And then alcohol poisoning, um, we're going to go into that more in depth later on in the presentation. But that's also, you know, a serious consequence that unfortunately a lot of students, even uh, students your age, um, experience. So coordination, unable to walk or talk clearly, and you're accident prone. So this kind of goes on with the vision, right? So you're unable to walk, you can't talk clearly, and you know, you're just super clumsy. So like I said, if you're at a party and you're with strangers, you know, that could put your life at risk, right? They don't know what's going on with you. They can't really communicate with you because, you know, they're not your friend. Um, unable to walk. So like the example I provided before, trying to walk home. You know, you know, you want to cross the street, but maybe you are just unable to walk fast enough or slow enough or even to just recognize that there might be a car coming. So that's why we unfortunately see a lot of accidents when it comes to, you know, people under the influence and trying to get home or just even at a party. There's a lot of risks involved. And then talking clearly. So I wanted to talk uh, about this one also. So with talking clearly, this can go both ways for the individual um, under the influence or the person trying to talk to you. So if you are under the influence, you're intoxicated and you are trying to communicate to someone that you want to go home. You know, in your head, you may think that you're communicating really clearly the directions, but the other person is hearing slurs and mumbles and they're not understanding you. And then the other way that can go is maybe someone else sees that you're intoxicated and they want to help you and they're trying to talk to you and give you directions on how to go home, but you are just not understanding anything they're saying. You see their lips moving, but you are not understanding a word coming out of their mouth. So again, you know, if you are trying to advocate for yourself or if someone's trying to help you, that could be a real issue, especially, you know, if you are under the influence and you can't communicate that properly. And then the last short term effect that I have is psychological. So major mood swings, violent behavior, depression. Um, that's why a lot of times in media and, and even in just real life, we see that people who are intoxicated, you know, they're getting into fights and they don't remember about it. They start crying uncontrollably. Just you have no emotional control and you're just kind of exploding with so many emotions, anger, sadness, happiness, whatever. So now that we went over the short-term effects, let's go over the long-term effects. So again, I'm going to start at the brain and I'm going to go clockwise again. So the brain, so brain damage, memory loss, and addiction. So we're going to go over addiction a little bit more later, but brain damage and memory loss. So those are two huge things, especially at your guys' age, you're in middle school, high school, you know, you don't want brain, brain damage or memory loss at this age or any age, right? Um, another thing with these long-term effects is a lot of these are really hard to undo. So you only have one brain and unfortunately, you know, if you are damaging it at a young age, it's going to be really hard to undo all of those negative effects. So let's move on to the throat. So risk of hemorrhage and hemorrhage is just bleeding and then increased risk of cancer. Going down to the heart, you can have heart attacks, heart disease and anemia. So that short term effect where you get high blood pressure, you know, long term, it can lead to heart attacks and heart disease. And then anemia, anemia is when you lack red blood cells and red blood cells, their job in your body is to bring oxygen to all your muscles and your organs and your organs and your muscles, they need oxygen to work properly and to survive. So if you have anemia, it compromises your body's ability to provide that oxygen to your body. And then let's go down to stomach. So peptic ulcers and gastritis. And gastritis is just inflammation of your stomach lining. So a lot of the time when people have gastritis um, due to a lot of alcohol intake, they are on strict diets. A lot of things upset their stomach. So eating a lot of things and drinking certain things really causes a lot of inflammation on their stomach. So it's a really uncomfortable thing to have. So pancreas, early diabetes and bad digestion. So when people are drinking alcohol, yes, they're drinking alcohol, but I feel like a lot of the times they don't also realize that they're intaking a lot of sugar at the same time mixed drinks, beers, liquor, a lot of those drinks have a ton of sugar in them. So you're intaking all this alcohol on top of all the sugar, which can lead to early diabetes. And then let's do muscles and bones together. So 
muscles, weakening and pain, and then bones, degeneration and risk of fractures. So like I said, you know, if you're intaking a lot of alcohol, you know, it really compromises your immune system and your body's ability to bring oxygen to your body. And because of that, um, if you don't have enough oxygen in your muscles, those muscles are going to become weak. And as they are becoming weak, that can become painful to you. And then that kind of goes along with the bones. If your muscles can't support your bones properly, right? Your muscles are supporting your whole, uh, your whole skeletal system. Um, you are at a risk of fracture and breaking your bones a lot easier. And then liver, liver damage and cirrhosis. Um, so your liver is in charge of filtering out all the bad toxins out of your body. And alcohol can really compromise your liver's job at doing that. So if you're intaking a lot of alcohol or maybe just a little by little, but over a long amount of time, your liver can really become compromised and not be able to take out a lot of those toxins. And then lastly, the nervous system. So the breakdown of the nervous system supplying the limbs. So um, nervous system, right? Your brain, your spinal cord, super two important things in your body that you need to survive in your function. The nervous system is responsible for so many things, how you move, how you think, how you feel. So alcohol can really compromise your nervous system as well. Okay, so how does alcohol affect the brain? I wanted to focus more on the brain. As we saw in that video, the brain has a huge impact in how you move, in how you think, the way you live, right? Um, so I wanted to go over this recap of the, of the weight 21 video before we get more in depth into it. So the brain isn't done developing until your mid twenties. So some people, I, the earliest is 21. That's why it is set at the legal age to drink alcohol is 21. But even some people, they don't have their brain fully developed until maybe 22 or 23. Um, so it's really important to take care of your brain now because it isn't developed. Um, the things that we do to our brain at a young age sets the tone for how your brain is going to uh, work and react to different environments and different things later on in your life. Everything affects our brain's development. So what I was saying, so what we consume, our environment, our friends. So that could mean stress, food, drinks like alcohol and our environment, where we're living, where we're going to school, how we're training our brain to do certain things like studying or even communicating with people. And then in the long term, our brain can affect the way we perform in schools and our jobs, right? How we talk to people, how we interview, how we study and perform on a test, how we wake up every day to perform well at a job. All those things, um, you know, rely heavily on our brain. So that's why it's really important to take care of our brain, especially at your guys' age. You guys are so young. So here I have in another video. So this one goes deep inside alcohol and the teenage brain. And I really like this video because I feel like learning about the brain can be really taunting at times. The brain is so complex and there's just so many factors to our brain. Um, I like this video because it kind of gives an animated version of our brain and it's a lot easier to understand. So I'm going to play this video and again, just focus on the video. I'll give you guys 30 seconds at the end of the video again to write down your notes. Adolescence is the transition from childhood to adulthood, encompassing a period of major physical, emotional, intellectual, and social change. Our brains also change considerably during this time. The developing brain is a learning machine, and from when we're born, it grows enormously as we learn more and more about the world. This means we end up with billions of connections in our brains, but many of these pathways are either too slow or not needed. It's during the teenage years that our brains are renovated, whereby most of these unnecessary connections are removed or pruned away. At the same time, the connections that are kept are insulated to allow for faster communication across the brain, a process called myelination. Pruning and myelination occur gradually over the teenage years and are greatly influenced by our experiences and interactions with the outside world including the alcohol and drugs we choose to take. 
Let's take a closer look inside the brain. The frontal lobes take the longest to develop. By about 25, they become your center for decision making, helping you to plan and organize, focus your attention, control your mood and behavior, and solve day-to-day -day problems. The temporal lobes are like an information processing center that builds your library for sounds, speech, learning, and memories. The cerebellum integrates your senses, helping you to balance, control, and fine tune your movements. The hypothalamus is involved in many functions, including the release of hormones that help regulate your temperature, hunger, thirst, and sexual development. And the brainstem is like the final checkpoint for information going to the body from the brain and vice versa. Alcohol affects the teenage brain differently to the adult brain because it's still developing and not all areas are fully operational. How you feel when you drink alcohol can be an indication of the damage it's doing to different areas in your brain. Alcohol affects the frontal lobes first, making you feel relaxed and reducing your inhibitions. This means you may talk more freely, act loud or rowdy, or do foolish things you later regret. As you continue drinking, your brain starts slowing down, reducing your ability to concentrate, make good decisions, and control your emotions and impulses. This means you might do things you otherwise wouldn't. In the hypothalamus, alcohol blocks the hormone that tells the kidneys to reabsorb water. This means more water is lost as waste. Reducing the amount of water available to the brain makes you dehydrated, which explains the headaches and body aches you may experience the next day, otherwise known as a hangover. Alcohol's effect on your cerebellum is evident when you lose your balance and fall over or have difficulties with standing and walking. This is why injuries are so common when people are intoxicated. Drinking alcohol particularly affects a part of the temporal lobe called the hippocampus, which enables us to form new memories. Alcohol interferes with the transfer of information from short-term memory to long-term memory. So if you drink heavily over a short period, you may experience a blackout, meaning the next day you can't remember what you said or did. Drinking at a level that causes blackouts means you're also much more likely to do something you wouldn't usually do and your friends may not be aware of how drunk you really are. During your teenage years, you need to look after your brain to keep it healthy, just like other parts of your body. Our scientists are learning more about the brain all the time, and research has shown that the damage alcohol does to the developing brain is not only short-term, but may be permanent. Look after your brain. It's the only one you've got. All right, guys, I hope you liked that video. I really like what she said at the end that you only have one brain, so it's important to take care of it now. So um, again, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to finish writing down your notes, to jot down some of the things that you learned, uh, and then we'll move on. So I will time that right now. All right, guys, so let's move on to social life and alcohol. So we went over how alcohol affects inside the body, right? Our muscles, our bones, our brain. So now let's take a look at how alcohol can affect things outside of our body. So I wanted to start with social life. So your social life is your life with your friends and your families in your home, out, your, out of your home. Um, so your social life and alcohol, I know a lot of the times when we take our first sip of alcohol or when just individuals start to get curious and experiment with alcohol, it's usually given to them by a friend or a family member, right? 
Um, so right, that right there, your social life is impacting how you are intaking alcohol. It's impacting the way you are introduced to this drug. Um, so with that being said, like I said before, just because your parents or your cousin or your best friend introduces you to alcohol, it doesn't take away the risk of alcohol. It doesn't take away any of the long-term, short-term effects that is occurring in your body. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, also about social life too is it's really important to stand your ground if you do want to abstain from alcohol. Um, so I'll give you a couple examples with your guys' age. So you guys are in school, right? And if you do encounter alcohol outside of the home, like at a party or something, um, you know, it's really important to say no. And we're going to go over refusal skills later. But that right there, your social life is already changing the environment that you're in. So maybe you have never had alcohol before and then you go to a party and then you see alcohol and people are offering it to you. That's your social life impacting how you're going to make a decision for your health, right? You can either say no or you can say yes. Alcohol at your guys' age can really also affect your social life inside of the home. So if your parents have a rule that they do not tolerate underage drinking at all, it's important to respect that, you know, there's a reason. If you do drink underage and your parents don't want to, that right there compromises the trust um, and the honesty that you have between you and your parents. And relationships with your family members are so important for relationship health, mental health, and emotional health. So you don't want to risk that. Even with your friends, you don't want to be that person pressuring other, uh, your other friends to drink alcohol, or you don't want them pressuring you to do alcohol or just anything in general, right? Um, if they are truly your friends, they're going to respect your decision. And just think about it if you didn't want to drink alcohol and your friends keep pressuring you, you know, how would that make you feel right there that compromises and affects your relationships with your friends. So your social life and alcohol, a lot of people don't think about their relationship together, but your social life really does have an impact on how you may or may not be drinking alcohol. So I have some stats on the screen. So about 75% of male students and 55% of female students have been involved in date rate and have that have been drinking or using drugs. So this includes alcohol. And those percentages are high, right? That's over half of male and female, 75% for males. So this could mean that maybe you're at a party and yes, maybe your friends are with you, but you're also surrounded by so many strangers. So that really puts your health at risk. Um, if you don't trust your date, avoid being alone with him or her. If your date is pressuring you to do things and you can see that they're getting angry, you know, we talked about one of the effects of alcohol is, you know, emotional disruption. You know, please just be around someone so that you can be safe. Um, if you are with a friend and they are under the influence, please make sure they get home safely. Um, I know you don't want to get in trouble, right, for drinking alcohol, your friend for drinking alcohol, but it's their life that's at risk. So call an adult to get help. You know, if you can't see that they're getting home safely, call someone that you trust, an adult that you trust. And then, like I said before, alcohol can affect relationships with your friends and your family. So the whole point of this is it's just not worth it, guys. Your relationships, your strong relationships with your friends and your family, they're so important and they're going to carry you through life. So drinking alcohol is just not worth the risk to um, affect any of those relationships. Okay, life risks. So more stats for you guys. So drinking leads to 400,000 students a year to have unprotected sex, putting them at a greater risk for pregnancy and diseases such as AIDS. Um, so 400,000 students, right? That's almost half a million students every single year. Um, 400,000 students your guys' age that are having unprotected sex and are dealing with consequences that they were not prepared for or they're not ready for, that their family wasn't prepared for. So like I said in the last slide, it's just not worth the risk. And even with these next two bullet points that I have, so the possibility for death, rape, accidental injury, and physical assault are greatly increased when your alcohol is involved is involved. So we can kind of connect the dots now, right? We learned about our health, how alcohol affects us, how it affects our clumsiness, our coordination, our brains, how we think. So it kind of makes sense that you'd be at a greater risk if you were intoxicated. 
And then drinking hurts many students academically. Alcohol can negatively affect academic performance and lead to lower grades. So if you are seeking out alcohol, you know, when you're in school, that's all you're thinking about. So you're not thinking about the lesson that your teacher is teaching. You're not thinking about studying when you get home. So it really affects the way you perform academically. And it's just so important to perform well while you're in school because you know that determines or it can determine the jobs that you're gonna get right after school or even um, learning skills in school that are important for communication with your family or even during your interview. So school is really important and alcohol can really affect the way you are performing. If you drink one night and think, okay, well, that's it. It was just one night. I can go to school the next day. You know, you may be experiencing like what that video was saying, like um, symptoms of a hangover. So you can't really focus and you're tired and you're dehydrated. So it really does affect the way you can perform in school, even if you're not drinking in school. All right. So media and alcohol. So media is any of the social media apps. So Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, even YouTube, those are all media platforms. And they do affect our perceptions of alcohol and how we drink or not drink alcohol. So the media sends us messages about what is popular, what's socially acceptable, healthy and unhealthy. So we follow people that we don't know, right? We follow celebrities, we follow people who have a platform on the internet, and we listen to their opinions about what they have to say about things, and that includes alcohol. So if you have a role model that you follow on Instagram and they're promoting a alcoholic drink, you know, you're more likely to want to try it, right? Because your role model is endorsing it. Uh, so the media is not a reliable source for health information. The media's main goal is to sell product and they don't care about your health. So with that being said, all these endorsements for alcohol, they are merely just endorsements. Their whole goal is to just sell, sell, sell. They don't care, honestly, about your age. They don't care about your health. They don't care about any underlying um, health issues that you might have. They want to make money off of you guys. And because you guys are so young, teenagers, your guys' age are on social media all the time. So they take this knowledge and use it to their advantage. Because they know you're on social media all the time, they want to manipulate your way of thinking into thinking things like alcohol is okay to drink, even if you're not yet 21. Um, so I have a quote from a research article uh, and it reads, such online displays of alcohol behavior have been correlated with off offline alcohol behavior and risky drinking. So just seeing alcohol, like I said, on these different platforms day after day from so many different people really changes our perceptions of how we see and view alcohol. And then it could lead to, you know, like this quote said, risky drinking behaviors. So the next thing I'm going to play is a commercial. So we are talking about um, media, right? Commercials is another form of media. Um, I'm gonna play it first and then I'm going to talk about it. Nice turtleneck. I'm a crazy. Virginia Black. One sip and woo. All right, guys, so that is the commercial. So without me even having that label on the screen, I think you know who that person is. Even if you don't recognize how he looks like, you probably recognize his voice or maybe both, right? So 
Drake is a huge um, figure in in the limelight, right? Everyone knows Drake. Even if you don't like him, even if you're not a fan of him, everyone knows who he is. So Virginia Black, this alcohol company, they know this, right? They know that a lot of people know Drake. So that's why they hired him to endorse their alcoholic drink. So using this knowledge that a lot of young people, you know, your guys' age, I think are the largest fans of Drake you know, young people, a lot of them under 21. So Virginia Black, knowing this information is going to use Drake in order to kind of push the, um, their product onto you guys. So let's break down that commercial. So Drake was about to take a sip of the alcoholic drink and he didn't quite yet take a drink. He put it down. Uh, the, he saw a pretty girl approaching him and she swerved him. So the other gentleman, the older gentleman, he was already drinking this drink and he was able to get the girl. He was more confident and the girl chose him. So think about what that commercial is saying. What kind of message is that saying to you guys, especially young people? You know, it's saying that if you drink this alcoholic drink, you're gonna be more confident and you're going to get pretty ladies. You know, you're gonna be confident and you're gonna get whoever you want. And does that really make sense? You know, if you drink something, you're gonna get a person that you want. No, it doesn't work that way, right? But this commercial, and there's a lot of commercials like this are pushing these messages out that alcohol makes you more confident and it makes you a better presence and it's gonna make people want to be with you rather if you are not drinking at all. So these are the types of things that are circulating in our media all the time. And like I said, guys, the media, they don't care about you. You know, it doesn't make sense for one media company to care about all of you guys individually. So it's really important to make decisions for yourselves. Never let social media make your life decisions, especially when it comes to your health. And you guys are such at a vulnerable age with your health. That's so important to take care of it right now. Okay, so with that being said, I want to get into um, those disorders and diseases and just more consequences that I've talked about earlier. So we talked about alcohol inside the body and then outside the body, and now we're gonna go back inside the body to see all those different things. So alcohol poisoning. So alcohol poisoning is a long-term long effect of alcohol use. So it occurs when high levels of alcohol suppress the nervous and your respiratory system, stopping the body from removing toxins. So right, that involves the liver. We talked about the liver and we talked about our nervous system and how our lungs are effective. Um, so over time, you can develop alcohol poisoning. And signs of alcohol poisoning are mental confusion, your coma-like, your vomiting, you have slow or irregular breathing. So you're breathing really fast or really slow. Um, you have low body temperature, but maybe you're sweating, but you still feel really cold to the touch. And because you have a low body temperature, you may be exhibiting bluish or pale skin. So unfortunately, alcohol poisoning can lead to death or permanent brain damage. So we talked about how a lot of those long-term effects are really hard to undo. You know, it is possible to undo some of them, but it's just really difficult. Alcohol poisoning is that next level where unfortunately it is not reversible anymore. You have permanent brain damage or you, you know, are dead. And unfortunately, 300 students die from it every single year. So 300 of you guys are intaking so much alcohol to the point where, you know, you're, you know, you're dead. Um, so on the left side of the screen, I have uh, your body size, amount of food and water in your stomach, and what you drink affect blood alcohol levels. So this picture that I have posted up on there, it kind of gives you one standard drink. And as you can see, it's different for each of the different types of alcohol. So it's going to vary from a beer to wine to liquor. So I bring this up because a lot of alcohol poisoning um, in young people simply is due to just confusion, confusion of drinks. You know, someone might be like, okay, well, it's just one drink. I'm not going to get alcohol poisoning. But if you are, you know, drinking liquor and that you get like a whole cup of it, you know, that right there is not just one drink. It could be five drinks. And depending on if you're short, if you're, you know, bigger or skinnier, it could really affect the way your body responds to it. So 
a lot of people don't really recognize that different types of alcohol have different standard um, amounts. So like on the picture, I have a picture of wine. You know, that wine glass is not full. It's not, it, five fluid ounces of table wine is one serving. And if you fill up a standard wine glass with wine, you know, that's two to three drinks right there. And you might not even know it. And even if you're trying to limit your risk of alcohol poisoning by drinking, you know, one drink, you know, it could actually be three drinks and it could actually really harm you. So then how do you, how does someone get alcohol poisoning? So binge drinking is one of the leading reasons why someone may experience alcohol poisoning. So binge drinking means you are drinking five drinks for a man within two hours. So five drinks within two hours. And then for women, you are drinking four drinks within two hours. So if you are hitting this amount of drinks, you are at high, high risk for a lot of health issues, including alcohol poisoning. Um, and we're gonna talk about next is addiction if you do binge drink pretty often. So alcohol addiction is when an individual continues to drink even when it causes problems. Um, if he or she stops drinking alcohol um, with, sorry, if he or she stops drinking alcohol, withdrawal symptoms occur. So when we think about that Weight 21 video, that first video I showed you, your young brain can change the hierarchy of needs um, in your body that your body needs. So alcohol, addiction, so alcohol addiction, you're drinking even though your body is having issues with it. Like that's how rewired your brain has become at this point of addiction. It wants alcohol over, um, over food, over water, over sleep. And then the second bullet point I have is he or she stops drinking alcohol. Um, if he or she stops drinking alcohol, withdrawal symptoms occur. So we talked about before that a short-term effect of alcohol drinking is if you're drinking alcohol, your body is giving you a message that it's not supposed to be there. So it, it makes you throw up, right? So alcohol addiction is almost the, it's right, the, it's actually the opposite. So at this point, your hierarchy of needs is shifted. So now your body is thinking, okay, well, I need alcohol to survive. So if you don't drink alcohol, it's going to start vomiting. It's going to start getting the chills. It's going to start giving you symptoms, kind of giving you a message that you need alcohol to survive. So unfortunately, students who start drinking before the age of 15 are four times more likely to become addicted than those who wait until they're 21. And that just goes along with what the Wait 21 video was kind of going over, right? You're more vulnerable, your brain is not developed yet. So that's why another reason why it's just so important to wait until you're the legal age of 21 or just to abstain in general. Okay, so we talked about inside the body, outside the body, social media, all those things, but how do we actually say no? How do we cope with things? So I want to go over coping skills right now. Um, so what is a coping skill? Co a coping skill is basically something you do to make yourself feel better. Um, I bring this up because there is a big myth out there that alcohol helps a person relax and unwind. And that is completely false, guys. Alcohol does not help you relax. It just numbs you. So if you are having a problem, if you are stressed and you turn to alcohol to help you cope with that, it is not gonna do anything for you except pause the problem. So it numbs you and then once you're sober again, your problem is still there, your stress is still there. It does not help you cope. So a healthy coping skill, what is a healthy coping skill? So a, he a healthy coping skill means that you're doing something healthy and positive for your body. So basically you need to do a good thing to get rid of a bad thing. So alcohol, we've talked about it a lot at this point, right? We all know it's a pretty negative thing at your guys' age. So if you're using a negative thing to deal with stress, another negative thing, that's just two negative things combined. And that's just not a healthy way to go about it. So up on the screen um, to the left, I have the emotion-focused coping skills and the problem-focused coping skills. So just different types of things that you can do. So emotion-focused. 
So maybe you're really angry, you're really stressed, or you're just having so many emotions and you're having a hard time dealing with all of it. Things that you can do to combat all of those feelings is exercising, taking a bath, giving yourself a pep talk, meditating, uh, problem-focused coping skills. So maybe it's not an immediate thing that needs attention, but maybe it's something long-term, like you want to work on your temper, you want to work on showing up late, um, you want to work on just something negative in your life that's pretty persistent. So things that you can do as a healthy coping mechanism is working on managing your time, asking for support, asking an, an adult or a friend for help, um, establishing healthy boundaries. So this uh, can relate to relationships. Maybe you're in a toxic relationship with a friend or a significant other, and you want to practice establishing healthy boundaries to help protect you know, your space and what you hold, um, all your values and what you hold dear to yourself. And then creating a to-do list. Maybe you have just a lot of things and you don't know how to go about it. Writing a list can really help you organize all of those things. Um, so another thing I want to say about coping skills is the ones that I have on the screen are not the only coping skills. I think Honestly, the best coping skills that you can do are hobbies. So do you like to play basketball, draw, um, I don't know, watch your favorite show with your family, hang out with your friend, read? All of those things are healthy coping skills, right? Because your hobbies, they make you happy. So it's important to do those things when you are feeling low, when you are feeling down, because turning to alcohol is never the answer. It's not worth the risk. Okay, so if you are offered alcohol, so I wanna go over refusal, refusal tips with you. So saying no to friends or family when they offer you alcohol is not easy, especially if they're your friends and family. It's almost harder to say no to them than if it was a stranger. Um, but I wanna tell you guys that if they truly respect and they care for you, they will respect your decision even if it doesn't match theirs. It kind of goes along with anything, like a sports team. Just because you have a different favorite sports team than your friend, that doesn't mean that your friend is no longer, you know, friends with you, right? They say, okay, all right, you like something different. Like, I'm cool with that. It should be the same thing for alcohol. So don't think of it as refusing your friends, but refusing to damage your brain and your body. And when you are refusing alcohol from someone, you need to be firm. It's kind of what I talked about earlier. You need to stand your ground. Um, maybe you have to offer other ideas to drinking, or maybe sometimes, depending on the situation, you just need to leave. You need to leave because it's just best for you. It's best for your body, your health, and your brain. So I have three examples um, at the bottom. So they are, no way, I have to drive tonight. Uh, yeah, right. My mom would kill me if I came home smelling like booze. And sorry, I just don't like beer. So a lot of these things you can say when you're offered alcohol. And, um, you know, sometimes these things may or may not work. But at the end of the day, your health is the most important thing. So do that for yourself. Um, and I know it's really easier said than done, right? I feel like my slide's not going to suddenly give you so much confidence, um, but I think that will give you confidence is kind of practicing. So up here, I have a slide on practicing these refusal skills. So I have a whole bunch, um, as you can see on the screen, and what you pick really just determines on the situation and your comfort level. You know, maybe if you're more shy and reserved, you're going to pick some, like a simple um, refusal refusal response. Whereas if you are super confident and you're not really shy to explain to people how you're feeling, you might use the reversal method of a refusal tip. So let's go over that really quick. So the category, so simple, you know, no explanation. You just say, no, thanks. You can even just say no. Declarative, you are saying no, but you're also kind of declaring kind of why. So no, I don't drink. No, I don't do drugs. And then excuses. You are kind of saying why you don't want to drink. So no, I'm the designated driver. No, I could get suspended from the team. Um, no, my parents drug test me. No, my parents are strict. All those things um, that are relatable to other people your age, especially if you're being offered um, alcohol by someone who 
kind of understands those things. You know, if someone else has a strict parent and you kind of bring up that refusal tip, like, no, my parents are strict, they're more likely to understand and kind of leave you alone with that. Um, alternative. So you're saying no, and you're kind of trying to redirect the activity from drinking to something else. So no, but can I grab a water instead? Or no, but let's play basketball outside. Or no, let's have some iced tea because we were just outside playing. Something, just some other activity to do instead of drinking. And then reversal. So for all my confident kids out there, for you guys that really don't mind saying what you feel and what you value, this is for you. So no, why are you messing with that crap? No, I thought we were friends. And I think the reversal, if you feel comfortable doing this, I think the reversal method is really great because it kind of makes your friends question why they're doing this stuff or why this person is doing this. So like I said, um, all these examples are gonna be different for every one of you guys watching. So I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds again to kind of just jot down on your paper, just to even think about what would you truly say? And I know this could all be uncomfortable, but realistically, if you had to choose one of these things, which one would you choose? So I'm gonna time that right now. Okay, so I hope you guys jotted something down or you thought of something that you would actually say. It's really important to go over this now because when you're in a situation where someone's presenting you with alcohol and you don't want it, it could be really hard to respond really quickly just to be under that pressure, especially if you're around a lot of people. So that's why it's really important to practice and to just be aware of things that you could say. So with that being said, I have another video. It's our last video of the presentation, and it is on refusal skills and how to say no. I really love this video because it goes through realistic scenarios of what someone could actually say to you and their response to it. So I will play this for you guys. When you're a teenager, you're constantly bombarded with good and bad advice, life lessons, homework, chores, and peer pressure. Often that pressure comes in the form of drugs and alcohol. It can be very difficult to say no at this age because you're afraid others will think you're lame or that you might get rejected by some of your peers. Even though you might know the real dangers of using drugs and alcohol, you still might have a hard time saying no. Well, the key to saying no is to practice what you'll say before you get in a situation where you're offered drugs or alcohol. That way, when the time comes, you're ready. Take some of these peer pressure related statements, for instance. Come on, everybody's doing drugs. Your response? I think plenty of people aren't doing drugs. Anyway, it's not right for me. Perfect. Here's another one. Hey, probably make you feel good. And you say, I already feel pretty good. I don't want to mess that up. Nothing wrong with that. Let's try a few more, like, Dude, if you're my friend, you get high with me. Your response? I really like you. I just don't like drugs. And let's not forget these. Come on, dude. Nobody will know. And? This is really cool stuff, man. You fire back with, I'm not taking any chances. I'd be grounded for life if I got caught. And? I know someone who got really sick from that. That's not cool at all. Arming yourself with a wide range of reasons not to do drugs or alcohol is a great way to keep yourself free from using a substance that you know can harm you or your friends. You might even set such an example that your peers will respect you and try to emulate you or come to you for advice. So don't be afraid to rehearse your reasons to say no and put them into practice when the time comes. All right, guys, so I hope you like that video. And that is 
it for the presentation. So I have my information down on the screen. So again, my name is Jade. My email is learning at jtnn.org. Um, and you guys can email me um, to that address if you have any questions or comments about the presentation. So before I get off, I want to tell you guys, just please review your notes. Please review what we learned today because you do have a quiz right after this. So thank you guys again for listening to me and I hope you have a great day and good luck on your quiz.